Assalamu alaikum. You are watching PTV World and I am Faisal Rahman with a special transmission on this very important OIC conference that is being held in Islamabad. And as we all know, the main reason is about the Afghan crisis. So this is in fact the largest gathering after the 15th of August when the Taliban they took over the regime in Afghanistan. Now as we all know the winter has approached there are a lot of crises whether we talk about the economic upset that is there or we talk about the banking collapse there is lack of uh, flow of money so the government in Afghanistan currently can't even pay the salaries of the government employees and having said that the crisis is so huge that it is believed that 60% of the total population of Afghanistan is at the verge of almost starvation there is no medical facilities as such and the people are really depending on the neighboring countries such as Pakistan and Iran perhaps and in the northern side uh, the uh, CS countries as well but having said that now the issue is so huge that Pakistan in fact took the initiative and uh, called the OIC members to attend this very important summit so that this particular issue could be taken care of as we all know the western world isn't supporting as such the Americans, they have frozen their 9.5 billion US dollars and uh, that was much needed uh, for the revival of their economy. And so the case is uh, from a lot of uh, European countries as well. In fact, they in fact initially uh, pledged uh, for help, but nothing has arrived so far. As we uh, will be in fact continuing this transmission for the next three days till Sunday. So this is the beginning in fact and uh, uh, let us show you a report that our uh, production team has prepared and after that I'll introduce you to our panelist and we'll start the conversation. A deepening humanitarian quandary of Afghanistan reflects the flawed approach of international community towards Afghanistan with tragic consequences. The crumbling healthcare system, economic meltdown of aid-dependent economy, pandemic, food insecurity exacerbated by drought and harsh winter all combined to create a perfect storm for killing more Afghans than bullets. Raising further alarm, the UN envoy for Afghanistan, Deborah Loin, said an estimated 60% of Afghanistan's 38 million people are facing crisis level of hunger in a food emergency that will likely worsen over the winter. Now is not the time to turn away from the Afghan people. We must find ways to prevent an imminent humanitarian catastrophe and the terrible loss of life that could happen over the winter. According to UNICEF, around 3.2 million Afghan children are acutely malnourished and 1.1 million children are at risk of dying because of severe acute malnutrition unless we intervene with treatment. Explaining the country's worst humanitarian disaster, Abdullah al-Dardari, the resident representative of the UNDP in Afghanistan, some 23 million people are in desperate need of food. The $20 billion economy could shrink by $4 billion or more, and 97% of the 38 million population are at risk of sinking into poverty. As an emphatic gesture, Pakistan has announced $28 million medical, food and other humanitarian assistance for Afghanistan, while also authorizing the transport of food aid from India through Pakistan to Afghanistan. The ensuing catastrophe is preventable as releasing the frozen funds. The Afghan Central Bank's $9 billion reserves, most of which are held in the U.S., would alleviate the current humanitarian crisis. UNICEF official Samantha Mort noted that this is not time for political brinkmanship. People in Afghanistan are dying and they need our support. Humanitarian aid is the last expression of human solidarity. And now to talk about it, let me introduce you to our panelists. We have with us in our studio on my right is uh, uh, Ma'am Naila Chohan. She is a former ambassador, senior diplomat. Ma'am, thank you so much for your time. And we also have Lieutenant General Retired Talat Masood Saab, who's a senior analyst. Sir. Thank you so much, Al-Saab, for your uh, time as well. And on Skype, we have with us uh, from uh, Germany, Helga Zepp Laroche. She's the founder of Schiller Institute. Thank you so much, uh, Helga Zepp, uh, for your time as well. Pleasure to have you on the show. But let me start off from you, uh, General Saab, if you allow me, sir. Sir, OIC's extraordinary meeting on Afghanistan. Great initiative by a country like Pakistan. Obviously, we expect a lot to be done. Hopes and expectations versus the reality, sir. Now, since we all know the kind of influence the United States of America has on certain uh, Gulf countries as well as in general on the Muslim countries, sir, if they are not willing, if they're not ready to release 
a sum of let's say 9.5 billion which is urgently needed in Afghanistan. This is primarily about the food security, about the shortage of medicine. It's about uh, the harsh winter and it, as you heard that 3.2 million children are practically starving. 1.1 million could die during this time period if the help doesn't arrive on time. So, Jal Saab, do you think the Muslim Ummah, as we say, is in a position to take a decision in favor of the current regime against the will and the wish of the Americans? Well, well I think the Americans should be ashamed of themselves, really. Uh, I mean, I'm talking of the government in the sense that, look, I mean, what they have done by having this sort of an embargo, what they, they are denying the poor people of Afghanistan, the children of Afghanistan, the women of Afghanistan, and those uh, men uh, who are really uh, uh, more or less starving, you know. So they want 60% or then it will get even worse. And a time would come then when you would find that 90% of the Afghans are without any food and without any shelter. So I think uh, it's a, I just cannot understand that America uh, which, genu which genuinely uh, has at times been extremely benef uh, a great benefactor uh, and uh, has been giving assistance, uh, you know, to one of the most uh, sort of des deserving sort of places, now uh, imposes a restriction and tries to punish the poor people of Afghanistan for you know, because the government has, is that of Taliban. Well, I mean, they were negotiating with the Taliban. There was no reason why on earth they should have really uh, imposed this penalty. But having said that, I think this, uh, the, the question that you have posed to me is genuinely, I think uh, Pakistan is doing a great job in the sense that it is assembling and trying to put the full mm -hmm. weight of the Islamic countries so that, you know, the voice is heard more effectively around the world because the world is at the moment not much pushed about Afghanistan. And uh, I think um, then there is also a possibility that the <coughs> Muslim countries or the Islamic group will also probably contribute in a way that at least it could elevate the immediate and uh, look after the immediate needs of the Afghans. And this is what they should be doing, that there should be an emergency fund, I think, that they have to raise. If they would raise that emergency fund and that is uh, given to these people and then it is also seen that, uh, you know, the food supplies and other things which are essential for their survival. And I think they also need some clothing, you know because uh, the winter is so severe in Afghanistan. So I think, uh, uh, I, I feel that this was a good uh, move on the part of Pakistan uh, to have assembled the Muslim countries, because uh, just Pakistan and Iran uh, raising their voice is not enough. <clears throat> Ma'am, your take on the same point, in fact. Yes, I totally agree with our wise senior uh, General Sahib. Uh, it is very true. It, it is a very complex situation in Afghanistan. Um, humanitarian issue is the primary issue at this moment. Correct. Uh, but in Afghanistan, it's, uh, you know, uh, I would say four dimensions of the problem, like you alluded to in your introduction as well, that there's an economic uh, crisis, there's a financial crisis, there's a social crisis, and of course the political one. Mm -hmm put them all together and Pakistan from the day one said that we would have a regional appro uh, approach to it as far as uh, the recognition of the Taliban is concerned and until that is done the western countries are unlikely to uh, give their financial or economic support to Afghanistan. So now politics and economics have got intermingled mm -hmm. and Pakistan is pursuing its uh, approach to put uh, the regional countries and then the Islamic countries together to find a solution pending establishment of a formal government in Afghanistan. Because at this moment it is an interim government 
and it is difficult for the rest of the world to recognize an interim mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. and until they recognize it they are unlikely very to very give uh, their um, assistance to them. When, when you say it is an interim government, uh, people do not even use the word government, they say yeah, it is a regime. Exactly. I but, agree. but the point is, do you think that uh, this particular summit that is being held in Islamabad, they will be able to come up with some sort of a solution where the western world in particular, because they matter and they matter the most. They will be able to say, let us suppose that this current regime is acceptable, but these are the conditions. Because whatever they could have done, they have been doing it actually. They have got so much uh, happening in Afghanistan, whether you talk about the terrorism activities by the non-state actors or perhaps the financial crunch they are going through, lack of food security and ma'am, people are practically living on the roads. I, Jalsab, I, I was reading an article in which they stated that 20,000 Hazara people are living in the outskirts of only Kabul and imagine the severe weather you are talking about. It is unbelievable, you cannot live in a tent in that kind of uh, uh, weather ma'am. Not everybody has a tent even, so the conditions are really dire there. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with you, I am sorry I used the word regime, but um, government, but it is basically uh, an arrangement I, I, I would mm -hmm. say. Uh, we have not really <laughs> cooked up a term for it yet, uh, but the thing is that uh, will OIC a foreign minister's uh, uh, meeting come up with a solution? Uh, it is difficult to predict because the uh, OIC as you know comprises uh, different countries from different regions which have different priorities. So it is Pakistan's earnest hope that as part of the Ummah we can come up with a solution which is uh, to save the lives in Afghanistan because that Primarily is Primarily it is a humanitarian crisis exactly, uh, and exactly. one has to it takes certain steps where people could be saved. At the end of the day, this is exactly like that. I still remember uh, when, um, I, as a kid, uh, when the Soviet Union, they invaded uh, Afghanistan and there were a lot of people who migrated to Pakistan. And at um, uh, the Eid uh, time, I remember during that particular time period when uh, Qurbani was being done, a lot of uh, planes used to come from Saudi Arabia and they would bring in meat for these mm -hmm. people. So. This is what we have seen during those crises, but currently it's more or less, even it's worse right now, but nothing is being done. But let's see uh, what uh, uh, Ms. Helga Zepp has to share with us. Now, ma'am, uh, looking at the current Afghan crisis and the summit that Pakistan is uh, having in Islamabad, now your take, I mean, what sort of uh, hope do you have uh, about uh, the Afghan people that, uh, yes, there is going to be some sort of uh, uh, help in terms of cash and kind, both, ma'am. Well, first of all, I think it's extremely uh, important what Pakistan is doing right now um, by hosting uh, the summit. I have a terrible act here. Um, <coughs> by uh, Pakistan taking the leadership in a situation where the West has morally completely failed. I mean, this is a moral bankruptcy declaration because this is not a crisis which was not uh, foreseeable because, you know, already one week after the uh, withdrawal of the US and NATO troops from Afghanistan, it was clear that the country was in a complete shambles. And now almost four months have passed since and, you know, it is uh, clear that uh, more than 90% of the people are in danger of dying of hunger, of, of the cold in the freezing winter. And this has been known in the West for, you know, several months. But in the news, uh, Afghanistan has completely disappeared from the Western media. So I think this conference is a real chance uh, to, to show uh, who is the moral superior factor in the situation. And I, I, I'm so ashamed that the West is not capable of I mean, the money which is being withdrawn by the US Treasury and European banks. This money belongs to the Afghan people and we are in a campaign right now with the Schiller Institute, both in the United States and in Western Europe, to demand that these monies be uh, unfrozen right away. 
But I, I actually would like to mention something which um, you know is a little bit more hopeful uh, element. I mean, I have called for Operation Ibn Sina. Ibn Sina was probably the most famous doctor in the history of mankind, the most famous physician. He lived about 1,000 years ago, and right now to build a modern health system in Afghanistan would be you know, that would be the beginning of overcoming not only the humanitarian crisis, but at the same time also starting a real economic development. Uh, and to give that the name of Ibn Sina, uh, it would bring forward. And I would actually hope that the OICD can, OIC countries, um, you know, being the Islamic uh, countries of the world, um, that they would adopt Operation Ibn Sina, if they all would work together, make Ibn Sina the synonym for the, not only saving the Afghan people right now in this incredible humanitarian crisis, but all working together to build up economically uh, this country, which you know has a very proud history. It was once known this whole region as the land of the thousand cities. Uh, Ibn Sina is not just a physician, but he was one of the great universal thinkers who contributed a lot to uh, philosophy and, and many areas of knowledge. So I think this is a moment where history can be shaped in a positive way. So I think the West has failed and now hopefully you know, the Islamic countries together with the neighbor countries uh, of uh, Afghanistan can step in and you know this is I mean, it's unbelievable what is happening. I mean, that, that the world would know such a humanitarian tragedy and not act. I think this is a, a, a point people have to really think what does that mean about the moral condition of the world. I think the Operation Ibn Sina could be a, a tremendous change in the situation. Now, Jalsa uh, uh, very rightly pointed out, I mean, yeah. she's some couple of very <coughs> interesting <coughs> points that uh, the lady has raised. First of all, sir, uh, when we talk about the current Afghan uh, crisis, uh, uh, they are beyond imagination, to be very honest, because just imagine there is no food, there is no money, uh, harsh weather, and on top, uh, nobody is ready to support you. So the Americans, they have always, uh, you know, championed the statement that we will liberate countries, and mostly they have tried to liberate the Muslim countries, and they ended up creating the worst chaos there. You talk about Syria. You talk about Iraq, Afghanistan, and sir, you exactly know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so perhaps, sir, if they were there to liberate and they ended up spending 2.2 trillion according to them, and interestingly, only a few families, in fact, uh, eventually uh, benefited, benefited mm -hmm. uh, from these. But sir, the point now is that uh, if the Americans are not willing to accept the regime of the Taliban, perhaps they are trying to put pressure on them and they want to talk to them from a position of strength. Are they actually getting that position of strength or do you believe that without the support of the West, the OIC and along with certain other countries like Chinese perhaps or the Russians, they can look after the issue to a certain extent, sir? No, I th <clears throat> think it's very important that uh, the West and especially the, the US must recognize uh, firstly the level of uh, catastrophe that is taking place in Afghanistan. They must help. Uh, Afghanistan because they owe it to them because you see the thing is that they have invaded they invaded Afghanistan and that by itself is a you know they should make them very guilty conscious of it because uh, you know it was not the fault of the Afghan people yeah Osama bin Laden was there but Osama bin Laden <clears throat> presence doesn't mean that uh, two point so many million, you know, 220 million or 23 million people uh, should suffer so much for so and many years. And once they believe that they have been, uh, uh, you know, successful in eliminating Al Qaeda and killing uh, yeah. Osama bin Laden. Laden, it's been over 10 years now. Yeah, and if that was the measure of their success, and uh, what about the other uh, failures? that have happened in Afghanistan and uh, because of their policies. So I am convinced that 
uh, unless America changes its policy, the Western countries will also be very hesitant in changing their policy towards Afghanistan. So I think at least they should allow the European countries to sort of uh, contribute and make some sort of a difference in what is happening. Now, you, uh, they, uh, one thing is good that they are at least chan channeling something through these uh, aid agencies and so on. But you know, this is no substitute for giving to the government. You have to give it to the government. As far as the quality of governance is concerned, well, you can put pressure. That uh, may be good for the people of Afghanistan as well. But this does not mean that it should be so conditional that uh, you know the very people for whom you are trying to advocate, they themselves are suffering so much. And, uh, then I think uh, it's extremely important for the Islamic countries to sort of uh, really use their influence, whatever little influence they have over the Western countries and especially America. And collectively, if they sort of really uh, raise their voice, I think it will have much better. But the question is, I mean, perhaps only those countries can help who are in a position to help. Yeah, like Saudi like Arabia. Saudi Arabia or UAE UAE and all. G6 countries, Gulf yeah, countries in, yeah. in particular. But sir, you, we all know the kind of pressure the Americans have on them, sir. I mean, uh, I remember I, I that Saudi Arabia yeah. and UAE, they were the first two countries along with Pakistan to accept the regime of the Taliban at that time. But currently, sir, we haven't heard much from them. Do you think they'll be able to deliver? To what extent, if so? No, I think, um, you know, the same logic that we are applying to Americans, we also should apply to the Muslim countries, irrespective of the fact, even Pakistan is not happy with all the policies that the Taliban are pursuing. Correct. And no, and neither is Iran, mm -hmm. uh, neither is China, neither is Russia. So uh, that does not mean that they are not really prepared to support the people of Afghanistan. And they don't want the poor people of Afghanistan to suffer. And because you see, it is not only that uh, the, the people of Afghanistan are suffering and Afghanistan is suffering, but it has very serious consequences for the entire region. And you know, we have gone through that experience that when uh, Afghanistan is in trouble, the whole world is in trouble, but more so the neighboring countries are in trouble. They suffer the most. And, and we have already seen what is happening now in Pakistan. Firstly, we are getting a flood of refugees in Iran and Pakistan. Then at the same time, we are also getting, you know, Tehrik Taliban, Pakistan and this, that and the other are getting activated. What does that mean? That means it is becoming a playground for all these forces which are inimical to, uh, and then, uh, you know, there will be also a lot of uh, uh, drug uh, smuggling, and drug mafias all becoming very, very strong. And very so active. I think that cycle, which was existing in the past, uh, will be repeated. Ma'am, now this is what suits the West, doesn't it? That turmoil in Afghanistan, the Indians very categorically believe that uh, if the situation remains fluid in Afghanistan, that suits us. Because that is going to affect Pakistan in a negative way. This is their policy and openly they admit that. Whether you talk about their uh, external affairs minister or you talk about Mr. Rajnath Singh, the defense minister or even the prime minister Modi. So, A. Secondly, ma'am, when you talk about uh, the, the regional countries or the region uh, getting affected, this definitely is going to affect Obor, BRI, CPEC and all and that again suits the Americans. So, the equation pretty much is tilted towards them, isn't it? I wouldn't say the situation is tilted towards them, but I agree with you that there is an agenda there mm -hmm. of having controlled uh, chaos. Um, Indians are definitely not interested in having that kind of stability in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, so are the Americans, because if they were interested in real peace and stability in that country, they wouldn't have left in the haste that they did. Absolutely. So, um, that we are not going to debate. What we are going to debate is how to deal with the situation that we are confronted with. Mm -hmm. And it is in the, you know, on the priority of the immediate neighbors mm -hmm. like Pakistan, Iran and the Central Asian Republics, uh, also China and Russia and the Gulf countries 
to uh, find solution to this problem because uh, humanitarian issue is of course the primary, but then it spills over into other problems that can affect our own stability. Mm -hmm. So, it is imperative that we find solution which is uh, acceptable to the Afghans because Afghans never like to take uh, dictates. It has to be Afghan owned and Afghan led, but we have to encourage them and help them. So, step one is the humanitarian and then encourage them to have political stability which would then facilitate other you know solution of other problems. Ma'am, yeah. when you say Afghan led and Afghan owned, don't you think this regime is actually Afghan owned and Afghan led because Taliban they were uh, constantly putting pressure on the Americans if you remember ma'am and eventually the talks they took place in Doha certain countries took the initiative uh, Pakistan did its level best to engage the Americans and the Taliban and eventually this was a solution but nobody expected that the Americans will just run away uh, one fine night and eventually end up blaming Pakistan and making us the scapegoat because it was their failure, not ours, ma'am. 2.2 trillion is not a joke. If they have spent that kind of money and eventually handed over uh, the Taliban regime to the Taliban regime after 20 years and after killing so many people, what is that supposed to mean? No, I agree with you. Uh, but the point is that when I'm saying Afghan led and Afghan owned, I'm basically talking about an inclusive uh, decision making process. Um, of course, uh, Taliban's are Afghans, uh, but within Taliban's also there are groupings, various factions, various factions. Mm -hmm. So uh, that fragmentation in that polity itself is challenging for the rest of the world to deal with, particularly the Afghans themselves. But if they come up with some inclusive mm -hmm. solution, mm -hmm. where all Afghans are represented, I mean ethnicities. The Tajiks, the Uzbeks, yes. the uh, Pashtuns, they should have their own, uh, you know. They should have their voice in the decision making process. That's when it would be really Afghan led and Afghan owned because then it's all Afghans. It's not just a particular group that's leading. And that particular group has to understand the importance of inclusivity as in representation of all ethnicities. Now, very interesting point. Now, let me uh, take this debate to uh, the lady in Germany. This has given a couple of important points. One is when Mr. Hamid Karzai was brought in, nobody knew him. And uh, he was there for two terms because he was the blue-eyed boy of the Americans. Certainly, when he <laughs> made certain remarks and he was pretty open, then there was this, uh, I would say, change as far as the leadership is concerned. Then two terms were given to Mr. Ashraf Ghani, who ended up running away, leaving the Afghan people. And interesting part was that in every election, uh, it was believed that they were rigged and uh, they were so close that uh, initially Abdullah Abdullah was made, uh, uh, you know, uh, the foreign minister. And later on, again, uh, since he was uh, also running for the campaign of the presidentship, uh, he said, well, I'm the president and ended up becoming the CEO and again then in the second term he was again given uh, another responsibility. Now the point is if that is acceptable to 